Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. You're listening to episode 27 of the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and in this episode, I'll share how you can bring Salfa into your music teaching studio. Hey there, lovely teachers. This week, we're diving further into Salfa. So if you didn't check out last week's episode and you're not familiar with Salfa and Kadai and all that nonsense, then you're going to want to go back and listen to that so you can catch up on what this sulfur thing is all about and how and why I believe it should be used in pretty much all music studios. Now, if you're already familiar with sulfur, obviously you don't need that catch up. But if you do need it, it'll be at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 26. That's the numbers two, six. Or if you're listening to this shortly after it went out, then uh, it'll be easy to find if you just go to Vibrant Music Teaching and click on the podcast in the top menu. Just to quickly recap on where I stand with this whole Kadai Salfa thing, I use Salfa in my studio to teach several things, sight singing, understanding of key signatures, harmonizing and how everything fits together. I find it an extremely useful tool in my studio. And I use movable dough Salfa with a lab-based minor. Again, if you don't understand what I'm talking about there, I did explain that last week, so go back and listen to that one if you're already a bit confused. If you're not, let's get going on how you can bring it into your music studio. Because even teachers with a lot of Kadai training, even former classroom teachers perhaps who have been trained in the Kadai methodology and have been using Sulphur for years, don't necessarily think to use it in their private music teaching studios when they're teaching instrumental lessons. I think it can be a really useful tool tool even one-on-one or with um, small groups or buddy students like I often have. So I'm going to share with you five different ways you can use Sulfa in your studio. If you want fully laid out plans that will completely get you to grips with Salfa and give you a structure to follow to catch your students up with using Salfa and also make you feel more comfortable with getting going with it, then you can find that in the Vibrant Music Teaching site. So if you're a member, you just go to the video library in the menu. If you're not a member yet, you can sign up at vmt.ninja and then you'll get instant access to this course, Salfa Skyrocket, as well as tons of others. But let's crack on with the five exercises today for using Salfa in your private music teaching studio. The first one is to simply get your students to sing along with all of their scales, arpeggios and other exercises like that. This very simple act of singing in Salfa with scales or with anything else you're doing means that those exercises do double duty. It's not going to take anything away from the fact that you're Students are training their fingers or their muscle memory with those scales or learning about the patterns they make or reading them or whatever they're doing. It's just going to add an extra layer of learning if they sing along with them. So I say do it. As soon as your students are able, get them to sing along in Salfa and you do it too. That's a good note to make actually about all of these types of exercises. You need to sing too. If your students are getting nervous about singing, if they're reticent to sing, normally if you just do it and make almost no comment about the fact that they're almost silent, then gradually they will increase in confidence. But if you don't sing, if you seem embarrassed to do it, it's going to be really tough to convince them. So if you're in a, a stage where you're not a super confident singer, um, I've been there, I still am there a lot of the time, but If you just fake it till you make it, I promise you'll get there. So you just sing, you do your best, and you will be in tune even if your tone isn't amazing, even if you don't have the best technique. This is all about just giving it a go. So sing along with your students' scales and arpeggios and have them do it too. This will get them to practice solfa, not just going forward, which a lot of students can actually do, partially thanks to the sound of music, but also going backwards. So you'll find a lot of your students in the beginning will drop out once you get to the descending scale. 
Um, just keep going. Like I say, you keep singing and they'll get it in the end if you just keep doing it with all the scales. That's a lot of time to practice it, you know? If you're doing a few scales in each lesson, they'll get a lot of practice with singing the solfa scale and also the arpeggios. So that's the first exercise. Just simply sing along with scales and other exercises. Number two is to harmonize simple tunes. This could be folk songs that they've learned by ear, such as Hot Cross Buns or any other folk songs like that. Or it could be tunes in their book that don't have a harmony with them. A lot of beginner piano methods, for example, will start off with tunes which are just in one hand or um, are between the hands maybe, but they don't have any harmony. Those are great places. They have great scope for adding your own harmony. And solfa can really help you to do that because saying, okay, which note goes with this one or which chord goes with this one, depending on your student's age and level, it's a little bit too much choice and it's hard to grasp onto. But just saying, which goes with this? Is it do or so? Or if you need fa, is it do, so or fa? You will very rarely with simple folk songs need anything else so just those couple of options or a few options that you know will work in order to harmonize that tune and then you just get to try out each one is it this one is it that one i like to start with just one note like i say do so maybe fa and ignore the chord right so you're just dealing with the one five or maybe four note in the bass going together with the melody and that's enough to bridge a real understanding of what harmony is versus melody and fill out those beginning pieces especially in piano method books where they don't sound particularly impressive but they sound a lot better with that little bit of left hand or little bit of harmony added in. I like to do this in my buddy lessons so my students come and most of my students take what I call buddy lessons which is where their lesson overlaps in the middle so they have half an hour together with a piano buddy. And I do this exercise a lot with them, where one is playing just the harmony and one just the melody, and they swap around, so we're creating a duet out of it. And they're the ones calling the shots on which one sounds better. Of course, I overrule occasionally if they've gotten it wrong or they can't decide between themselves, but it means we create this simple structure where they can easily remember their duet part and play together and really be listening to each other. And they'll sing along as well. They'll be singing, you know, do, so, so, do, or whatever the pattern is to help themselves remember. So again, they're getting that practice and reinforcement with the solfa as we go through. So that's exercise number two. So far, we've sung along with scales and we've done some harmonizing with simple tunes. By the way, if you're looking for simple tunes, uh, folk songs to teach your students by ear to sing with, then my favourite source for these is from NICOS, which is the National Youth Choir of Scotland. So as you may have guessed, if you have to ship that across the Atlantic, it might be a bit tough. But if you're over my side of the Atlantic, definitely check that out. And even check it out if you're in the US. I don't know what the shipping is like. So it's obviously coming from Scotland. These are collections. They're called folk songs for sorry, excuse me, singing games and rhymes for, and then there'll be different types. So for the early years, for ages 9 to 99, uh, different ones like that. Order any of those books. Honestly, they're all great. And even if you can't afford to get the different ages, it won't matter that much. They're a great source of singing games and stuff. It's super for using in group workshops if you do those. And I'll pop a link to Nikos in the show notes, just if you're looking for folk songs. Now, on to exercise number three that we can use to bring Sulfur into our studio is to do singing first sight reading. So anytime your student has a new piece or a piece of sight reading, you can decide which of those is better to go with in your studio or with your particular student. You get them to sing it first in Sulfur. Work out what it would be in Sulfur. Sing it as a rough idea of how it would sound. It doesn't have to be accurate. And then they play it and then maybe sing it again or sing it along, playing it a second time. They will learn so much from doing this about reading, about notes, about singing and about ear training. It's such a fantastic exercise to do. I know several teachers who do this with all their sight reading cards. So 
They're using the sight re- uh, piano safari method. They come with these sight reading cards with these simple melodies on them. And a lot of teachers will do those as singing first. And I'll do them as singing in solfa first as my students get used to solfa and can, can manage that. And it, it really is just such a rich activity that can take literally one minute out of your lesson. So that's number three. On to number four, singing warm-ups with posters. Now again, I'll leave a link to this in the show notes because I have posters that you can download to use with this. So this is, um, I have these hand-signed posters of Salfa that I have stuck on the back of the door in my studio. And I use them in so many ways to do with Salfa. But one of the biggest things I do is simply pointing to them as a way to direct students of what to sing. So I'll just point to them with it. In fact, it's a drumstick. You could have an actual pointer if you have one. A drumstick just seems to be handiest in my studio. And I point to each one and we sing them. And then I might get a student uh, to point to them. As I say, I have a lot of time with students, like two or three students together where the lessons are overlapping. So I'll get one student to be the pointer and the others are following what they are pointing to and singing along and we all sing even the conductor has to has to sing as well and I specify to them which notes they can use and whether we can do steps or skips so they're learning about those patterns understanding their own learning process as well because they'll ask me well why can't we do that uh, for example I banned the skip from so to re for quite a while and you know, it's pretty simple to just explain, take it to the piano and sing along with the piano and go, isn't that pretty hard to find? Yeah, okay, so we, we'll delay that till later. Let's do the ones that are easy in the beginning. And that's kind of part of the Kadai method philosophy as well, is that kids should be doing things that are easy, that are accessible to them, right? So I'll have them sing along with me pointing to the posters. Again, that can be one minute of singing. It doesn't have to be this huge commitment. You don't have to revolutionize your entire studio and switch to some Kadai structure or or method for everything you do. You can just take little excerpts, little pieces of that method or of Sulfa and apply them to your teaching and see what the results are. Do some experiments, you know. Okay, our last exercise I want to share with you today, the fifth one, is oral ID. Now, what I mean by this is that I'll play do, re, mi, for example, on the piano in any key, and I'll sing along with it as I play, and then play the last one and ask them what note it is. I have students answer me in different ways. They can sing the note back to me, or they can say the sulfur name, or they can be doing actions to answer me. So I have them sit down on the floor for do, kneel for re, stand up for me. When we introduce so, I have them do that with their hands in the air or one hand in the air and then two for last, stuff like that. So we build up to the pentatonic scale that way and then build up to the major scale from there. I'll be specifying which one of those they're doing, but I'll mix it up. All have basically the same result, but they just provide a bit of variety for my students and keep things fun and interesting for them. Another way I've done it actually is to have them answer me on the piano. So where I'm playing, I tell them where we are that we're on the three black keys or on CDE or something like that and have them play the note that I'm playing back to me. So that's five ways you can use solfa in your studio. Let me take you through them quickly again so you remember them. You can sing along with scales and arpeggios. You can harmonize simple tunes using just say do and so and figuring it out by ear. You can sing all sight reading or all new pieces before you play them. You can have your students sing warm-ups by pointing to posters, which you can grab on the Colourful Keys site, which I'll link to in the show notes for today. And you can do oral ID exercises where you're asking them to tell you or show you which sulfur note you played last from um, a short list of possibilities. So that's five simple exercises. What I really want you to do is to try one of them. Pick one of those. Which one sounds the best to you right now? Which sounds the easiest and the least? nerve-wracking to get going with if you're a little bit nervous of this pick one of them just one don't try to do them all pick out one idea from that list of five or an idea that was sparked by that list of five and put it into action resolve to try it in your next lesson or in this week's lessons or if you're not teaching right now if you're on a break 
then your next lesson back. Write it down for yourself, commit to it, give it a go. You might just have fun. I, I'd, I'd be willing to bet that you will. Next week on the podcast, we're going to dive into different rhythm systems. So we've been talking about Kadai and Salfa. Another big part of Kadai is the rhythm syllables, and there are many other rhythm syllable systems. So I'm going to take you through the different systems, what I see as the benefits of each, where I land with them, and how you might like to use them in your studio. That's next week in episode 28. Before I let you go today, though, I want to let you know that you can catch the show notes for this episode at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 27. That's the numbers two and seven. And I also wanted to let you know that I have a webinar coming up soon, all about improving your student's rhythm in three minutes or less. So much like the Sulfa exercises today, these are super quick ideas for rhythm, and we all know how much we want to improve our student's rhythm. So that webinar is going to take you through different exercises and ideas and how to improve your student's rhythm in just a few minutes out of every lesson. You can find out more about that just by going to Vibrant Music Teaching or Colourful Keys and signing up for the webinar there. Or you can go to vibrantmusicteaching.com slash rhythm to sign up there as well. That's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed these Salfa teaching ideas for your studio. Let me know which one you try out and how it goes in the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers Group on Facebook. And until next week, I hope you have a fantastic set of lessons this week and I hope you have fun. Bye for now. If you're a member of Vibrant Music Teaching already, you can catch the full Salpa Skyrocket course in the video library. Just click on the video library tab in the menu up the top and you'll see Salpa Skyrocket at the top of the library. And if you're not a member, you can sign up and you absolutely should at vmt.ninja get access to that course as well as tons of others and everything else going forward. 